In today's video, we're making this beginner friendly to do list. We can add a new to do new task. And then we can choose to either click this button or hit enter. And this new task is added to our current to do list. We see we can scroll down to find our new task here, along with our existing tasks. Learn JavaScript, feel good about my progress. If we tap ourselves on the back, we see we can check that to do. Now it is also shown as being checked and it is grayed out. We see that we also are tracking how many to do's we total have. And then of course, we can also delete all our to do's making the list disappear. If we add a new to do again, and then let's also click this time, we see that it's added again to the list. This is a very beginner friendly tutorial and a perfect project to learn JavaScript. No prior JavaScript skills is needed to start and complete this project as I will walk you through the entire code step by step. The to do list is a perfect project to actually learn both beginner and some intermediate JavaScript concepts. We will learn things like variables, what the difference between the let and the constant variable is. We will learn to use a local storage and JSON. We will learn how to select HTML elements. We will learn to structure and listen to key events in our browser. We'll learn to create functions. We'll learn if statements. We'll learn how to manipulate the HTML using our JavaScript and how to use arrays and objects. Ready to become a JavaScript pro? Let's get started. First off, I have my Visual Studio code open here. That's our editor that we're gonna write all our code in. And then I have an empty folder on my desktop. I'm just gonna drag that folder into Visual Studio code. Let me make that full screen. And here we're gonna start making our HTML file. We're going to call it index.html and the main HTML file is the one that we show on the browser. It's where all the elements of our project live and that's always called index.html. That is the only file we are needing to kind of display on the browser and then all the other files we have are going through the index.html. So that's kind of our root uh, file for our project. Inside of index.html, we want to write a exclamation mark. And then we get inside of Visual Studio Code, we get some shortcuts here. If we click the first one, we get a basically template for what an HTML document needs to have at the bare minimum. I just hit save and now you see that the code jumped around. That's because I have Prettier installed. That is an extension in Visual Studio Code that you can click here and you can search for Prettier and then you're just gonna install the first one that pops up, install that here and that's basically just gonna make the code jump around like mine if you want the code to be exactly the same. Why would you want the code to jump around? Well, basically this is formatting our code for us and ma making it so that we have a uniform and also synthetically correct and easily read the code. If I made a lot of space and I made this code very weird and hard to, hard to read like so, and trust me, it can get much more harder to read and I save, it basically formats the code in a human friendly way. So prettier, install that if you don't have it. First off, in any HTML, we have this doctype.html that is basically telling the browser when it reads this document that this is gonna be an HTML uh, code here. That's basically all this doctype does. And then under that, we actually have our HTML, which lives inside of this opening HTML tag and closing HTML tag. All of this lives inside of this. And then you see if we go one step deeper in the head here, opening head tag, closing head tag, together they make up the head element. And then inside of here is the children of the head. And then the head is the child of HTML. And then inside of them again, we can have children again. So HTML is basically made up of elements in blue and they can be children or parents to each other. Furthermore, in the head section here, we are explaining to the browser a lot of content that we don't actually see on our page, but content that is very useful for the browser to know. 
So to give you an example, I'm gonna click on this little button down here that says go live. If you don't have that installed, again, that's an extension, install live server, install that. That is gonna make you click this button here, go live, and that is gonna open our browser as we can see here. And notice what it says up here, document. That is what is in the title. If I now change that to to do, and save, we see that that is updated. So the head is everything that it doesn't live within the actual browser window, but it can be up here, it can be behind the scenes of the actual uh, screen that we see. Another quick tip, go up to view in your VS Code, turn on Word Wrap, and then we can fit all the code inside of one page, no matter how wide it is. Then the two meta tags here, basically say this one says use the character set of UTF. Also, if you hover over things in VS Code, it also usually tells you what it is quite well. Hover over name, we see that that's that. So UTF-8 says use the standard characters that we can find. Basically, most characters that exist, that's going to be UTF-8, like the character E or the character you know, hieroglyphics, all of them are in there. And the next meta tag is so that the width and the height is represented uh, correctly across devices. Then of course we have our title and that's all there is to the head for now. Then we have our body and this is the actual things that are on our page here. So if we add an H2 here and we say hello, we save that, we see that that ends up in the body which is inside of this white frame. Enough theory, let's build our to-do. So let's remove this H2 element that stands for heading two, which is uh, a bit smaller than heading one, and those go down to heading six. We are gonna start by giving this body another section element. As we can see, I just need to start writing section, hit enter, and that's gonna create the opening and the closing tag of that element. Inside of this section, I'm gonna have other things, but I'm basically putting most of my content, if not all of them, inside of this section. But I'm basically going to put most of my content within this section. In addition to the section, we're just gonna have a footer. So that's gonna be the two children of the body element. Inside of our section, we're gonna have something called an input. A section is a way to divide our content into sections, properly named, and the footer is the bottom part of our website, usually. And then an input is where we take in any information from the user of our website, and then we can use that for something. For example, when you log into a website, that's gonna be an input element that you're typing your password into. In addition, though, we're just gonna put an H2 element up here, because we want to give this a little title. We're gonna say to do list, save that, and we can see that we have our title here with a little input element. We are gonna put this input element inside of something called a div. So under H2 and before the input, write div, hit enter, and this is a basically a catch-all element. It doesn't mean anything by itself, but it's very useful to create boxes, borders, and logic within our HTML. So let's copy-paste this, copy out, control X, the input, and we're gonna put it inside of the div and hit save. Actually, we're gonna put it like this and then hit save. So now we have a lot of elements inside of our HTML, but they're not really containing a lot of information yet because we haven't added uh, attributes to them. So starting with our section, we need to actually add a class to this section, a class attribute. And what this says is we're gonna call this section something and we're gonna call it a class of to do. And this is gonna be very useful because later when we're creating our style sheet, we are going to reference this class. We're gonna target it by going through this to do class here. We're gonna use this to do 
to give this some style. Then we're gonna do the same for this div. We're gonna give it a class and we're gonna say, this is an input, this box here. Same thing, we're gonna use that to give it a certain kind of styling in our CSS and then later in the JavaScript, we're gonna use it to target it, to do logic with it. Then in our input, we already have a type text. That's correct, that was just uh, generated for us automatically. In addition to that though, we're gonna give it a class and we're gonna give it a class of input dash field. These are classes that I'm just making up. I'm calling them whatever I want, whilst the type is text, which is something that is, you have to choose between certain uh, options. In addition to the class and the uh, type, we want to give it an ID of to do input capital I, notice that, this is what is called camel casing, which basically means that you start your first word with lowercase, and then when you're starting a new word uh, inside of the um, element here, you are basically uh, capitalizing it. That's camel casing. And the difference between them is that an element can have uh, many different classes, but it can only have one ID. And one ID is unique and can only be put inside of one element, whilst all elements can pretty much share the same classes. So I could give all of these elements the class of input field, but this one can only have the class of to do input because now it's used and no other elements can have it. ID is unique, class is not. Lastly, we're going to give it a placeholder, which is what you see inside of here before you type. So let's say test, save that, and we see that we see test here on our browser. Let me just zoom in that so you can see better. We see that test is written. If I start writing, it goes away because this is our placeholder. That's how it works. We're not going to write test here. We're going to say add a new to do. There we go. I start writing. It disappears. Perfect. Of course, we need to also have our button here to send our to do in. So we're just going to start writing button, hit enter. We get our button. Inside of the button, we're going to say add. And we see that that pops up there. Doesn't do anything yet. And our button is also going to have a class. And that class is gonna be called btn, which is short for button. Then under our div here, if it's hard for you to understand what's going on, you can also close certain elements to make it easier to see. Under our div, we are going to add a ul, which stands for unordered list. An ordered list starts with one, two, three, etc. An unordered list has bullet points. And inside of an unordered list, you actually need one element, a list element, which stands for, or list item, which is an li. And that li is not gonna have anything inside of it, it's just gonna have an id, remember that's unique, called to do capital L list. And also this ul is gonna have a class of scroll. As we can see, we have our bullet point, and then under our UL, we're gonna have another div, and inside of this div, we are gonna write an HR, which is a fancy way of saying basically a break. It is a line in our uh, HTML. If I save, we see that it pops up. It's a divider, more or less. And this divider is gonna have a class of counter and then under the HR we're gonna have another div with a class of counter dash container and then inside of the counter container we are gonna have a P element which stands for paragraph and inside of the paragraph we're gonna have a span and if we hold over the span we see that it doesn't really mean anything on its own, but it can be useful when used together with global attributes, a bit similar like divs. 
it used to separate different elements. Inside of the span, we're going to say a space and then items total because this is where we're going to keep track of how many uh, to do list items we have. Sorry, this we're going to copy paste and put after the last span and then inside of the span, we're just going to say zero like so because inside of the span here, we're going to be adjusting this zero based on how many we have and this is just going to stay the same. Then under the paragraph, we're going to add a button and it is going to have an ID of delete button. And then here we're going to write delete all, which is going to be our button to delete all the R tasks. Then we are done with the section part. Let's close that so it's easier to see. Then let's go into the footer and we are going to create a div here. We are going to give it a class of footer. And then under that, or actually inside of that div, we are going to give that a paragraph with a class of made dash by. And there we're going to say made by. Under here, we're going to add another paragraph with a class of author and inside of that paragraph we're just going to say our name or in this case John Doe and that is all for our HTML as we can see if I expand this it's not all that but that's all we need now we can move on to style our to-do list let's open our explorer here and we're going to create a new file. We're going to call that style.css, hit enter, and then we see we have our style sheet here. The way this works is that we're going to target, for example, our body by writing body and then curly brackets. And then we're going to say background color is going to be red and then hit save. And then we see that we don't actually have a changed background color. Why is that? Well, because we haven't actually told the CSS and the HTML to communicate. And how do we do that? We do that by writing here inside of the head a link and hit enter. And by default, that's going to have a relationship of style sheet. It's going to, this link is going to know that it's going to be connected to a style sheet, which is a CSS file. And here we're just going to link the actual path to it. So if we write dot slash, we see that we get our style.css here uh, recommended. So click that, hit save, and we see we get our red background color applied to our body element, aka the whole page. Back in our style sheet, let's remove the background color. Instead, we're going to write margin which is the sides around an element. It's basically spacing around elements. If you right click on your browser, hit inspect, and then we just hover over, we see the elements tab here, we hover over different elements. The margin is the orange color and the padding is the green color. And we're gonna get more used to using those, but we see that the H2 by default has some padding. If we click the H2, we see here in the styles that by default it has a margin of 0.83 EM. And you're going to be seeing EM in your browser and REM when we are writing our style sheet. And that's just a different way of writing the sizes instead of pixels and 16 pixels is 1 EM and also 1 REM. So it's just a different way of writing sizes for things. Let's click our body. We see that we have a margin around here, the orange uh, part, and we see that the margin is eight pixels. So let's just set that to zero and we see that things pop right up to the corner of the page. Let's make this a bit bigger so we can see our uh, website a bit more like so and still keep our inspect window here because it's useful. Then we are going to 
give it a height as well of a hundred, not percent, which would kind of work, but we're gonna give it a hundred view height, which basically means that the body is gonna take the hundred percent of however big this screen is. So if you have a thousand pixels, so if you have a thousand pixels or five million pixels or three pixels high screen, it's gonna be all of that, which is very useful for when you want to create responsive uh, design that looks good across screen sizes. We're also gonna give it a background and let's just give it a gray background for now. Uh, we're gonna change this in a bit. We are also gonna give it a display of flex. I have a separate video on flex um, that you can watch here, but basically what it does is it moves content around to put it in a very stupid way. But as we can see here, when I hover over body in the element, we see that we have these dividers here. That is because we have decided to display the content using Flexbox. So we see we have our one content here, we have another vertical content here, and then we have some empty space here in, in uh, purple. And if I remove this display flex, it goes back to how it was. Let's see. You see that everything is just one thing under the other. What display flex does is that by default, it puts one element next to another element ver uh, horizontally. And we can decide how we want to then space these out and we can even space them out vertically which we're going to do by adding flex direction of column and now we're putting them back to under each other and you might be wondering why did we do all of that because it was like that from the get-go well because we, now we can not only have them close to each other under like this or you know, use a lot of padding and, and margins and to like space it out so it looks good centered on the page, which is what you used to do in the past. But now by using Flexbox, you can dynamically make the content spread itself out in a very natural and um, visually pleasing way. So if we add another justify content here, space um, evenly, then we see that now the content is at least vertically being spaced out kind of in the center and with a little space between them, which is what we want. So with three lines of code, we have avoided with Flexbox uh, a lot of padding on each element, a lot of spacing and a lot of like retrofitting across all different screen sizes to get this effect. So Flexbox is really useful for responsive design. And then in order to get them in the center uh, horizontally as well, in the X axis, not just the Y axis, then we also want to align the items to the center. And there we go. Now, if I full screen my screen, we see that it's still in the center. If I close this bar here, we see that it moves to the center. And basically, whenever I, ha however big my screen is, this is going to be horizontally and vertically aligned in the center. If I now hover over the body, you see that it is spaced out with even space between the two main elements, which is the section here. And the, and the footer, sorry, here. I hope that made sense. Again, I have a separate video that you can watch after this video if you wanna deep dive into Flexbox. Now, we're gonna get into a bit more complicated stuff, but it's a good warm up to JavaScript. So now we're gonna actually create something called variables. And what is a variable? Well, in essence, it's something that holds some value that can be interchanged. So we're gonna start by writing dot root or uh, colon root. And when we use this root colon, here we're targeting the body, here we're targeting the root. The root is kind of even deeper than the body, if you can think about it this way. The root is the entire project, and the entire folder, even the, the head and the, everything inside of there. So the root is like everything, think about it this way. And inside of here, we're gonna write dash dash, and we're gonna say gradient. 
and then we're gonna say dash here again, uh, sorry, colon, and then we're gonna say, um, let's say red at the start here. Now, what we have made here is a variable with a name gradient, and it has the property, the value of red. And if I now go down to my body here and give it a background of the variable of gradient, and I hit save. Uh, ah, sorry, I have to also remove this background down here, which is great, and I hit save. We see that the background of the body is now red. Very intense, but it's red. And I told you that the variable can change uh, its value, and it can. If I now say blue here, and I hit save, we see that the body has gotten a blue color, even though what is said in the body stays the same. It's because we're referencing the variable and not, and then, then by proxy we're referencing the value inside of it. So it's kind of going backwards, jumping here, checking what the value inside of it is, and then going back to the background of the body and putting the color here. And that's the beauty of variables is that now we can use this gradient and we can reference that in a million different places but we can simply change it in one place and that would change all of the places. So it's very useful to get started with using variables in CSS and not hard coding things that you don't need to. But this is called gradient, so it's not a simple color like this. We are gonna say linear dash gradient and then we're gonna write colons here and then inside of those colons we're gonna say it's going to be 180 degrees, which is the direction of the gradient, which is going from one color to the next. And then it's going to be the first color, RGBA, which is basically a way to just say a color. It's a color code. Uh, 45, 112, 1253. And then, so those are the red, blue, and gr red, green, and blue colors. And then the A is for the opacity. So 0 0.73. And then we want to start this first color at 0%, which is basically all the way on the left side. And then the second color is going to be a bit simpler because it's we don't need this last part here. So we're going to say hashtag 163E. 9, 2, and then we're going to say that's going to be 100%, which is, in other words, on the complete opposite side. And then let's save that. 180 degrees goes from bottom to the uh, top. If I put 0 degrees, it starts from the top to the bottom. If I put 45 degrees, we see that it starts in this corner. If I put 90 degrees, it starts on the right side, so it's moving this way. 90, 0, 45, 90. 180. So like so, and that is our gradient for the body. We are going to make a couple of more variables here. So we're going to say dark is going to be equal to 001747. And we're going to say gray is going to be equal to hashtag B1BA. C, B, and then we're going to say dash dash gray dash border is going to be equal to RGBA, and then colon 210, 210, comma, 210, comma, and then 0 0.75 opacity, like so. Under here, we're going to say gray, gray, light, light, like so. And that's going to be hashtag six times E. One, two, three, four, five, six. Save that. And then it's going to be gray, dark. A lot of gray colors here. 
and that's going to be hashtag 405175 and then we're going to write a blue and that's going to be hashtag 2d70 fd save that two more green that's going to be equal to hashtag 00d8 a7 and then the last one here is going to be white that is just going to be hashtag f6 times save that okay we have all our variables let's make this page a bit smaller again so it's easier to see our code like so now we're ready to create the styling for the rest of our content here. So let's target our button. We are putting a little dot in front of it because that's how we target classes. So up here we were just targeting the element body, but here we're targeting the class button. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to give it a color of variable. They're already coming in handy. And here we can see we can choose between them. And we're going to choose white. And now we see that the color of our button became white. And then we're going to give it a font size of 1.1 REM. Remember that's 16 pixels is 1 REM. And we just made it a bit bigger. Then we're going to give it some padding. That's the green inside of elements, whilst the margins are the orange around. 0.7 REM in the top and the bottom direction. And then we're gonna say 1.5 REM in the left and the right direction. As you can see, if I now say this is 5.5 REM, it's gonna add a lot on the sides. As you can see, if I add like so, and I add eight or nine here, it's gonna add a lot in the top and the bottom. So that's how these work. If you only add one, it adds it all around, like so. So putting that back to what we are supposed to have, like so. Then we're going to add a border radius, which is how we get to smooth out the edges of our elements. So we're going to say 0.3 REM, and we're going to give it a background color of variable blue. Like so, we're gonna give it a border of none to hide the border, the gray border here that is not very pretty, like so. And we're gonna give it a position of absolute. So when we give something a position, we are basically, we have a couple of options. So basically how an element is positioned in the document like this. Uh, it's showing here, it's a great uh, description. The top, right, bottom, and left properties determine the final location of positioned elements. So it's how something sits within our document. When we're saying position absolute, we're saying this part here, this button, if we inspect it, it's going to sit absolute within its parent. And that's going to be the section element here. And that's going to come very in handy when we're going to place this button compared to the input text so that regardless of how wide the screen is, the button is going to stay kind of the same. And we're going to give it a right property so that we can now adjust it based on from where it starts of 0.5 REM. We see that that goes 0.5 REM from the edge here and then from the bottom that's going to be 0.5 REM as well. As I see now, this is not the correct placement of this button. So if we go to our index.html and we find our button here, we see that I have actually placed it in the wrong place. So control X to cut it out. And then we're going to go and scroll up and we're going to put it inside of this div with the class of input. So we want to actually place this under our input here, there. I don't know why I didn't place it there, but hit save. And then we're going to save here like so. 
and now it is placed in the correct spot. Okay, so back to our CSS. Now we're gonna target all the headers that we are using. We're actually not using all of them, but let's just target them in case h5 and then h6 and then also the paragraph and then we're gonna give all of them because if we separate by comma we can target and style all of them at the same time we're gonna all give them a margin of zero and hit save and that's gonna help us get a bit more detailed styling then we are going to start on our to do let's just make a comment by holding control k c and then here we're going to say to do container and that's how you can comment in your code to add a bit of structure so it's easy to see what's going on so here the to do container is starting and we're going to target the class of to do and if we inspect here our elements we see that that is this section that holds all this all these parts here including our button down here. So here we're going to say that the to do is going to have a display of flex and save that and now we see that the content has been uh, spaced out next to each other again because remember that's what flexbox does by default but we're going to change the direction to say column instead now it's back and now we can justify it to space around the content again like so and we're gonna give it a border radius of 2 rem we're gonna give it a background color actually just a background of variable and that's gonna be white like so we're gonna give it a padding of 3 rem looking much better we're going to give it a height of 50% of the parent's height so that's the body and we're going to give it a width of let's say 60% of the parent's body which is the body and now if I take more space we see that it's going to still take 60%. So that's one of another tool to make responsive design that doesn't need a lot of code. Then we're going to give it something called a box shadow, which is a fancy way of saying basically a shadow behind this whole box here. So we're going to say zero and then we're going to say one REM, three REM and then one REM. And then we're going to say RGBA and then colon zero, sorry, parentheses, zero, 23, 71, and then 0 0.15 for the opacity. These are the directions and the lengths of the shadow. And this is the color. And hit save and we see that a very faint shadow has popped up. We are also going to give it a max width of 30 rem, which means that when we are in full screen, let's do this. I'm also going to zoom out because now we're very zoomed in, so it doesn't really show. But when we're in full screen, it doesn't get bigger than this size. So if I go back here and I remove or I comment out this max width, we see when I go full screen, it still takes 60% of the width, which doesn't really look good this wide. So we're saying take 60% of the width until you get to 30 rem, then grow no more, like so. That's what max width does. So I'm gonna zoom in a bit more just so we can see what's going on. Then we are going to target the H2 and we are gonna say, we're going to text transform this and we are going to say upper case and that makes our heading here uh, upper case. We're also going to give it a height of 3 rem like so creates a bit of space between the to do and the, the heading. We're also going to give it a color 
of the variable dark, which is a very dark blue. And we're also going to align this by using text align. We're going to align it horizontally uh, in the center, like so. Then we can target our input and we're going to say that its position is going to be relative to its parent. And we are going to display it using flex, like so. And then we're going to target the input field. And we are going to say it's going to have a width of 100% of its parent. It is going to have a border of 0.06 REM. That is the thickness of the border. It's going to be solid. You can choose dotted as well. And it's going to have the color of D2, 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 BF, which is a gray color as we can see around here. Then we're going to give it a border radius of 0.5 REM, which smoothens out the borders, makes it round. We're also going to give it a padding of 1.25 rem and let's now zoom out a bit so we can see let's zoom out all the way almost all the way so we can see a bit more how it looks in the real life and then we can give it a font size of 1 rem ah as i can see now this is not being targeted correctly we have our button down here as well we are needing to target not the input element, but the input class uh, by adding a dot in front of the input here. Hit save and we see that now this is lining up and our add button has been put uh, relative to its parent and displayed flex here inside. So now that's correct. Let's move on to target the input element now not the class and only the element with and then we're going to give it these brackets we're going to say the element the input sorry of the type equal to text so only target the input which has the type of text and if you remember here we have an input with a type of text so when we are targeting that we want to say colon colon and then placeholder. So we're targeting the placeholder of the input here. And we're going to give it a color, which is this add a new to do. We're going to give it a color of variable of gray. Hit save and we see it graded out. Now we are going to target the to do container. We are going to display it using flex. And then we are going to give it a gap of one REM and hit save. And when we hit save, we see that it doesn't really do anything. It is because this element doesn't really exist yet we're going to be adding it in our JavaScript, but we're going to get back to that. But for now, we've given the styling it needs. And then the UL we're going to target, and we are going to say that you're going to have a padding of zero. You're going to have a margin of zero. So that's the unordered list where the um, dot is. And you're going to have an overflow in the Y direction, which is the vertical direction of scroll. And we're adding this so that when basically this list is going to be too full for the space, it's going to give that scroll bar as we can see the start of here. But now we don't have any elements here, so we can't scroll. Then we're going to target the list elements, which are going to be our actual to-dos. 
We're gonna give them flex as well, display flex. We don't have them now, so we're not gonna really see a lot of stuff happening here, but we're basically just aligning them like we like it. We're gonna give them a gap between each of 1.2 rem. We're gonna also give it some padding, 1.3 rem. Then we're gonna target our to-do list and then our paragraph inside of that. When we say this, we're saying going to the ID targeted by the hashtag called to-do list and then inside of the to-do list target all the paragraphs. So that would be to-do list, let's see, that is here. So every paragraph, which again you see doesn't exist yet, we're going to create that with JavaScript, target all of the paragraphs inside of here. And then what we're going to do, we're going to give them a color of variable, actually it's just going to be uh, 8F98A8. I don't know why I didn't use variables here, but I could have. But let's just keep it this way for now. We're hard coding a couple of colors here. Then we are gonna target the disabled, another class that doesn't exist yet. And we're gonna say display of flex. And then we're gonna say text decoration of a line through. Now this is gonna be a class that we add when an item is checked. Then we're going to add this line through, which is going to cross out the text. This is going to make a lot of sense when we get to the JavaScript. Next, we're going to target the input of the type of checkbox another element that we are going to be adding and before the checkbox we are gonna basically add our little checkbox mark here. So the content of this checkbox is going to be forward slash 2713, which is the Unicode for the character of checkmark. So we're just gonna add that. And then we're gonna display that using inline block which is uh, basically adding elements as a block, one next to the other, and not flexbox, which is more uh, fluid. And then we're gonna say it's gonna have a width of two rem. So this, this is the circle we're talking about that we're adding later, and then a height of two rem. And we're gonna give it a font size of 1.7 rem. And we're going to give it a text align of center. We're also going to give it a border of 0.06 REM. It's going to be a solid border with the color of variable gray border. Also, we're going to smoothen the edges border radius 50%. That makes it a circle. We're also going to give it a color of transparent, like so. So no changes yet seen, but when we add it later, we're going to see that it looks perfect. Then let's copy paste this down, like so. We're going to target the type of checkbox again, but now we're going to say before and then after, like so. Here we're targeting the check mark when we've actually checked it. And here we're targeting it when it is unchecked. So we're gonna give it a color of, let's see, variable white. And then we're gonna give it a background color of variable green. And then we're gonna give it a border of 0 0.06 REM solid and then variable uh, green. 
and also a border radius of 50%, like so. Then let's target our counter, which is this one down here. And we're gonna give that a border of 0 0.06 REM, solid, and then variable of gray light, like so. Oh, actually, that was the line here. Next, let's target the counter container. And here we're gonna say it's gonna have a height of two rem and a display of flex and a justify content of space. Let's see between, as we can see here, it's starting to space out nice and evenly. And we're gonna give it a color of variable. Gray, not green, gray like so. Then let's target the counter container and then the paragraphs inside of there. We're gonna align the self. As we can see here, this sits a bit higher than this uh, horizontally. So we're gonna align self to the center and that puts it center within this height here. Then we're going to target the counter container again, and then the button inside of there, which we see is this button here. Then we're going to give that a border of none. And then we're going to give it a background color of transparent, like so. We're going to give it a color of variable gray and we're gonna give it a font size of one rem like so then we are going to target our footer and we're gonna give that a display of flex we are gonna give it a gap of 1.8 rem we're gonna give it a background color of variable white. We are gonna give it a padding of 1.2 rem. Two. We are gonna give it a border radius of 0 0.5 rem. And hit save and we see it pops up nice and neat. Then we're gonna target the made by and also the author. And we are gonna give them a font size of 0 0.9 rem, just a bit smaller. And then we're gonna target only the made by. And we're gonna give it a color, sorry a color of variable dark, gr gray dark. And then we are gonna target only the author and give it a color of variable, and that's gonna be blue, as well as a font weight of 500, like so. Let's say bold here, like so. And now we're gonna style our scroll bar here. So let's target our scroll and we're gonna say it's gonna have a height of 15 rem. Then we're gonna say scroll, scroll bar width is gonna be thin. Then we're gonna target the scroll and say colon colon web dash web kit. Let's see, web kit scroll bar. 
this is a bit finicky, but it's basically to ensure that it looks good across uh, different browsers. So we're gonna give it a width of 0.6 rem. Let us copy paste this down, copy and paste. Scroll WebKit scroll bar, and here we're just gonna add dash thumb, thumb, like so. And inside of here, we're gonna say background color variable blue, save that. And also border radius 0.5 rem. Let's copy this one, hold down. If you hold shift and alt and press down, you can copy it down. And here we're gonna change the thumb to track. And here we're just gonna say display none. So we don't see it now because we don't have actually tasks here that are, is filling up the space. But as soon as we add tasks, so now we can write here, but if we click the button, nothing happens. This is now basically a static web page. It doesn't take any info in, it doesn't do anything with the info, but it looks pretty good. And that is all for our style sheet. Now let's move on to our JavaScript. So let's create a new file. We're gonna call it script.js. And then we have to actually, the similar way as with our style sheet in our HTML in our head, we have to actually link the HTML and the script. So under our link to our style sheet, we're gonna write script. And then inside of here, we are gonna say src, and that is gonna be dot slash, and then script. And then behind that, we're gonna say defer, which is a attribute, it's an add-on that we say that before you run this script, run the entire HTML first. And we just avoid bugs this way. Because otherwise the HTML in the browser is read from top to bottom. So it would read it from the top. And then when it came to the script, it, the script will be containing a lot of references to things that are down here under the script. And that's gonna cause errors. While when we have the defer, it's gonna skip the script, run through all of the different things here, and then it's gonna recognize the IDs and the classes of things when it runs the script last. That's what the defer does. Now we're ready for our JavaScript. Let's go back to our JavaScript file. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna say retrieve and then hit the control KU. That's gonna comment here. Retrieve uh, to do from a local storage or initialize. Spelling is not my best skill and empty array like so let's turn on word wrap here which we have to do per like so per file so what we are doing here i am basically writing what we are going to do in each section so in this first section we're going to retrieve our to do from local storage what does that mean well if we right click on our side here we hit inspect and then here we have uh, things we have elements we have our console if we hit this arrow we see we have application if let's just make that a bit bigger like so and we can drag it out here we see that inside of application we have something called storage and inside of there local storage and then that's this website here and here we see that we have something called a to-do. Uh, this is something that I have from the past. Yours probably doesn't have this. Uh, any of these, yours probably looks like this. And maybe even it doesn't have this theme because I've specifically set my Chrome theme to dark. But uh, in, in the case of that yours is empty or it, that it only has a theme or maybe something else as well, that's a okay. But this is basically where we're gonna store 
our to-dos when we are creating them so that when we are adding to-dos we're storing them here so at the start when we refresh our page for example we don't want to clear all our to-dos we want to retrieve our to-dos from local storage and if we haven't been on this page at all we want to just start a whole new uh, basically save uh, spot here and that's going to be in the form of an empty array. And what is an array? Easily put, that's an array. This is an array. It's these two brackets. And inside of an array, you can put a lot of things. You can put numbers. You can put uh, things like hello. In that case, it will be hello. That's a string. Or you can put even other um, arrays or you can put for example objects and what is an object well instead of brackets it's curly brackets so that's basically the essence of what an array is it's a way to store information and both an array and an object store information and they can store the same things but in essence an array has brackets and an object has curly brackets. And they are very useful tools in our JavaScript toolbox. So the first thing we are gonna create here in order to store our uh, to-dos or to even retrieve our to-dos is to create a variable similar to in our style sheet. And the way we create a variable is by using the let keyword. If you've been looking online, then you might be coming across something called var for a variable. That is the older way to write a variable. So let to do is equal to one. Let's just say that. So now I'm saying that the variable called to do is equal to one. And why did we change from the keyword var? Well, because now in the past it was var and that was the only way to write a, a variable. And now we have something else called not a variable, but a constant, which we initialize by saying const and then this uh, test equals to two. So if we try to change this to do later, if we're referencing it, and then we say, well, to do is not equal to one anymore, it's equal to two. That is a okay. But if we try to do that with const, we say test is not equal to two anymore, it's equal to 20. Then that is gonna give us an error, whilst this is gonna run just fine. And basically that helps us define certain values that is meant to be changed and certain values that is meant to uh, be kept constant. So that is why we don't use the var anymore, although we can still use it in, and it's gonna be the same use case as let. So with that out of the way, let's actually create our let to do. So the to do is gonna be equals to something called JSON which stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And it's basically a way to format JavaScript code that is easily read. And you don't have to think more deeply about it for now, because we can go in detail about it, but think about it basically as a way to format our variables and our arrays and the way we store our information so we can actually read it and uh, send it between the different places we want to use it. So we're going to say JSON parse, which if we hold over here, we see converts a JavaScript object notation. It converts this JSON uh, into an object. So it, it starts as a string and then it turns it into an object. And if we remember, an object has this form. And then it's going to be a lot of data in here, like so. And that is basically how the JSON object looks without all these jumbled code here. It's a bit prettier than that. 
So what do we do with this now? Well, we are parsing something. What are we parsing here? Well, we are trying to get a hold of, retrieve to do. We're trying to go into this local storage and get something from here. And so we're gonna say inside of local storage, we want to get item. And what is that item called? Well, it is going to be called to do. And if, so let's just save that. So if there is a to do here, we're getting that item and setting it equals to let to do, which might be a bit meta uh, if you're not used to this way of thinking, but basically think of it like this. If this already exists, because we've used the browser before, we're just going into this list and setting our to-do to be the same as it was in the past. But if it doesn't exist, then we are gonna say, or by denoting these vertical two lines, we are gonna say, or it's gonna be equal to an empty array. So this part is the first part, and then this means or, and then this part is the second part. So let to do, the variable to do is equals to go and get the local storage item with the name to do. And if that doesn't exist, then we're going to say, well, then let to do is just an empty array. And that's your first piece of JavaScript code, if that's your first time writing JavaScript. So I know this is very theoretical, but we're gonna see this in action very soon. Then we are gonna create a couple of constants. So a constant, as you remember, is something that is not meant to be changed. So that's very useful when we are referencing HTML elements that stay the same element, that they, they keep the same ID and class. So we don't need to change them. So a security measure is to just use the constant keyword and not the let keyword so that later down the line, we can't change this name by mistake or change the value of it. So const to do input equals to, and so what is to do input? Well, it's basically what we are wanting to reference here. In our body, we have a to do, and then inside of the class input, we have an input here. So we're trying to get a hold of this input. And the way we can do that in JavaScript is we basically have to make a reference to it. So think of it as we're referencing the HTML here. We're gonna reference this to do input here with the ID of to do. So we're make, basically making a, let's say a clone of it or a copy of it that we are referencing. And how do we do that? Well, we're saying go into this document, this HTML document, and go and get the element. Let's see, get, oops, dot get element. And you can see you can get it by class, by name. We're gonna say get it by its ID, and then parentheses, and that ID is called to do capital I input. So get that to do. So now to just show you some JavaScript, uh, actual visually and not just theoretically. Now we've defined this to do input in our document, in our JavaScript. What we can do now to test that it's actually finding anything is we're gonna console log it. And that is basically, as you can see here in the browser, we have something called our console. It is basically a very useful tool to tell us what's going on in our uh, script here. So now that I have defined the to-do input, I can use it. So I'm just gonna console log to-do input and then hit save and we see something popped up here. We see that it came from script JS line six, which is the line we're on here. And it is console logging to do input. If I press this here now, you see that we have input field to do. And that is basically, you see we have a lot of attributes here that we are not basically using. We're not 
they're, they're all hidden in the background and that's true for most uh, HTML elements. But you can see that basically this is our input. You see input, hashtag, to do input, input field, and that is our input here. If I save, sometimes it also shows, I don't know why it shows it sometimes in this way and sometimes in the other way, but we can see if I hold over it, it is showing the actual input field. Okay, great. Now we have console logged. It is working to target these. We're gonna make a couple of more. So const to do list is gonna be our next one. And we're just gonna copy the same way here. I'm gonna save ourselves some uh, typing document. And we're gonna get element by ID. It's gonna be instead of input, it's gonna be capital L list like so. So we're just referencing the different elements that we're gonna need on our page to make the JavaScript work. Let's uh, shift alt and then hit down twice to just copy down the whole uh, code. And the next one is gonna be called const to do count. That's gonna be the counter here. Get element by ID and that's gonna be to do count like so. And the fourth one, the fourth const is gonna be the add capital B button. And that's gonna be document and not get an element by ID. We're gonna use something called query selector. And that is to target a class. And we're gonna say dot btn. And be sure to have a quotation marks around. So like that. And then we need one more const. That's the last one we're creating here. And that is gonna be our delete button. button. And document dot get element by ID. I use the arrows here to go through the recommended suggestions by um, Visual Studio Code. It saves a bit of time typing and it's a useful way to be uh, a bit more speedy with your coding. So when you have selected the one you want, get element by ID, you can just hit enter and that finishes the typing for you. And then quotation marks, delete, delete button using camel casing. Now we have all our elements. Now we want to initialize, initialize our project. So what are we doing here? Well, we want to start our project because now nothing is still working, nothing is happening here. So how do we start our project? Well, we need to actually listen to some changes because now the only thing our project is, is a static web page. And the thing that changes the static web page to a dynamic web page is change. So we are going to listen by listening to the document, which references the whole page. And we're going to say add event listener. We're literally every, you know, microsecond. I don't know what the timeline is, but very, very often, like many, many times a second, we are listening to events. So that can be a click, that can be a hover, that can be a typing. There's a lot of different events, but in this case, we are just listening. In the entire DOM, content loaded. Oops. Entire DOM content loaded like so. So we are using this add event listener. We're gonna listen to the DOM content here, the page here. And we are gonna say when something happens on this page, and we're gonna run a function here. And this is how we define the function. We say function, and then these parentheses, and then what is gonna happen inside of the function. So when we have our document open, we're listening 
and we are having a function that is continuously running inside of our document. And then we are going to say add button. Where is this coming from? Well, that's the add button we've created here, which is the button. That's this blue button. So we're targeting the add button. Notice that we don't, we don't need to say the const again, because here we are creating the button. Here we are just referencing it. So we're saying add button. We want to add an event listener to this button. And then what event are we listening to? Well, it's going to be a click because we are clicking this button, right? Now nothing is happening, but eventually we'll be able to click it. So when we click it, what do we want to do? Well, we are going to call another function. It doesn't exist yet, but it's going to have the name of add task. And that is everything we're going to be doing for now. Ah, let's not forget our uh, comma here. Then let's just make this function add task uh, so we don't forget. So function, remember that's how we define the function. But here we define the function without a name. Here we can define a function called add task and then still adding the um, parentheses and then you know some logic in here let's just uh, comment that out let's just make this screen a bit bigger so it's easier to see what is happening here well when we start our document when we start our page we're continuously listening to something happening and then we're specifically listening to if we click this button and then when we click this button, we run this uh, function here and that's this function. And we're going to create the logic for that function later, but for now, we're also going to add another event listener. So under here, we are going to listen for the to do input by adding our event listener and we are going to listen for a key down. And that is basically any press of any key on our keyboard. And when that happens, we're going to run a function that is going to take an argument. And you see all our functions have these empty parentheses, but this one has something inside and that is an argument because we can send something into our functions. And here we are sending an event, which is the key down. And here, then what happens when, when we press a key, we send that key in as an event into the function. And here we are inside of the function. What happens then? Well, we're going to ask if, and if is basically just a question. If something, then something happens. But if that is not true, then whatever is here doesn't happen. So if the event, which is the key. If the event dot key is equal to enter, basically, if we're pressing enter, then we want to run a piece of code. What is that piece of code? Well, we want to say first, and this is going to be maybe a bit complicated, but event prevent default, because whenever we have an event like this, we have a default um, behavior of the browser. Usually for the input, it's reloading the page or sending us to a different page. So we are basically saying, don't do that. Don't refresh the page or send us to another page. That's what we're saying with this event prevent default. That's just a safety we're putting here. But then we get to what we actually want to do here instead. We want to say add task. Again, we are referencing the add task function. So as we can see here, also, you might be wondering why we don't have the brackets here. That is basically just some lazy typing. We should always add these, sorry, not brackets, parentheses. So basically, we are uh, calling the add task if we click the button and if we uh, hit enter here. 
and then we are into our add task function. You just made your first logic in JavaScript, so pat yourself on the back. Before we're done initializing our logic, let's add our delete button here as well, because we want to make it live and functional as well. So we're targeting our delete button. We're saying add event listener. Here we're simply gonna listen for a click as well. When something is, when it's clicked, we wanna say delete all tasks. And that is also a function that we haven't made yet. Let's copy that and define that function now. And let's just copy that there so that we also don't forget to create that task. In addition, last in our initialization here, we want to also display any tasks that we already have. So display task plural tasks is gonna be our last function that we initialize this document with. Same thing here, let's define that function, display tasks, and like so, copy paste that. It's also gonna have some logic. Great, we have started our uh, JavaScript code. Now it's listening for events here, but nothing is happening, of course, because these uh, functions are empty. So let's start by creating our add task here. So let's take away the comment and we're gonna say const new task because we can also create our constants, not just outside here globally, as it's called, we can also create them inside of functions. We can nest a variable that only lives within this function. And if I try to access this constant anywhere else outside of here, it's not gonna work. So constant new task is gonna be equal to to do input, which if you remember here is this constant that we defined, which is basically this box here. And we're gonna say dot value, which is going one step further. Now we're saying this box, but then the value that I am typing in here. So the text value is actually this value here. And it doesn't have to say value, you can say whatever you want. So whatever you want, that piece of text is this value. And then we're gonna say trim, and that is an inbuilt um, function. You see that it's a function, it turns yellow, because JavaScript has a lot of inbuilt functions and methods as they're called. So trim, whatever that does is basically, if we have a text here, and I add a lot of space, is simply gonna trim away the space, like so. That is what we're doing here. It's just an added safety feature. So we're just defining this new task as whatever we write in here. If new task, the one we just created, is not, is not equal to, and that's how we write that, by saying, exclamation mark and two equals. And what's the difference between one equal sign and two and three? Well, one equal sign means we're setting this to this, but three equal signs means we're measuring. Is this equal to this? Well, if I said like this, I would say this is equal to this now. And if I have an exclamation mark and two equals sign, then I'm asking if this is not equal to an empty string. What is an empty string? Well, text is a string. Whatever I put inside of two uh, brackets here, curly, bra uh, curly brackets, that is gonna be a string. 
In other words, it's simple text. So what we're saying here is if new task is not empty, so if I've written anything inside of here, then I'm gonna run some code. And the code I'm gonna run is I'm gonna say to do, which is remember, that's the first thing we made. That's the list we have in our um, local storage. I'm gonna say to do, and I'm gonna use another inbuilt JavaScript function called push, which is basically adds a new thing to the to do, new element to add to the array. So remember, either the to do is something already or it's an empty array, which is gonna be the case for us for the first time. So what I'm saying is here, push whatever is here, we're gonna push that into here and we're gonna save it there because that's what we want. We wanna add it into our to-do list. So how do we push? Well, we need to add it as an object and we don't really need to do that, but we want to do that because we don't wanna just add one thing at a time. For every task, we want to add two things. And that's how we can use an object inside of an array. Because we're gonna keep track if each task is either disabled when we check mark it, or if it's enabled when it's still left to do. So it needs two values per to-do task. So that's gonna make sense uh, in a moment. So text is gonna be new task. That's whatever we write here. That's our first value. Then our second value is gonna be something called disabled, which is, we're just making up these names. This text and disabled is just variable names that we have chosen. And then that is gonna be set by default to false. So every new to do is gonna have the text that we give it, and then it's gonna have a disabled value equals to false, because it's gonna by default be enabled. Then once we have done that, once we have pushed that into our uh, to-do array, we wanna run the save to local storage function that we haven't made just yet either. Like so. And then we want to clear the value. Once we've added our text to a to-do list, we don't want to still have it here. So we want to clear that text. So we're going to say to do input dot value is equal to an empty array, sorry, empty strings, which basically sets this empty again. And then we want to call our display tasks function which we have here already. So now let's just copy this one and create that as well, function, and then save to local storage. Local storage, we're gonna say, we're gonna set the item and we are gonna say, this item is gonna be called a to-do. And then when we have that item, we're gonna say JSON dot stringify this to do like so let's check out what happens when we actually run this add task function here so let's try to add our first task so if i inspect here and i go to application we see that a local storage is for now only holds the theme dark what if I add now uh, first task and I hit enter? Now we see that there is a key with to do and the value is text first task disabled false, which is exactly what we made here. And if I click, let's say second task and I click this button here, uh, nothing is happening because yeah we don't actually use 
the parentheses here. Sorry for saying that earlier. Uh, they're not supposed to be here when we are calling it in the uh, event listener, neither in the delete button here, like so. We don't put the parentheses here. So we're just gonna save and try again. Let's see, second task. And now the click works. So that is good. Let's just see if the delete tasks work as well. I'm just gonna write some a console.log here. And we're gonna say test just to see that the button works. And let's see, delete button. Ah, we see that the test is running. Perfect, okay. So sorry about that. Uh, be sure to uh, fix the add task and the delete all tasks without the parentheses behind. So back to our application, we see that we have our two tasks. And now we see that whatever I add here gets added to this list. And if I open one, we see that it has disabled false and the text that we have given them. How cool is that? And that is all saved basically in our browser local storage. Now, if this was a real app uh, with a server, you wouldn't be saving it necessarily in your local storage. You might be doing that as well, but you would normally send it somewhere to store it safely so that if your browser goes down, you clear your history, you can kind of get a hold of that information uh, from a server. So now we have our tasks in our local storage, but they're not showing up. So that's the next thing we're going to do. We're going to go and try to actually display these tasks. So we're going to go down to the display tasks function. We're going to delete the uh, comment here. We're going to access the to do, uh, let's see, the to do list that we made up there. And we're going to say that the inner HTML, which basically means the HTML inside of this. And we're going to set that equal to an empty string. Because when we start this um, project for the first time, um, and when we are running this uh, task function over and over again, we don't want to be kind of doubling all our to do's. So we only want to be adding the newest to do if there wasn't one there already. And this is basically how we're going to be doing that by setting it to empty first, because then we're going to be re adding all the to do's that we have in our list. How do we do that? Well, for every to do, or actually for each to do, which is the correct syntax, we're going to take the item actually double parentheses in here. We're going to take the item, which is the to do, and we're going to take its index, which is its position compared to all the other items. And then we're going to say, we're going to run a function. And this arrow is just a different way of saying function. It's a different way of writing a function, but this is a function. And also this is a function. So this is a function within another function. So for every, for each item, that's every to do, and it's index, we're going to say, we're going to run this code, we're going to basically create another element that we're going to put inside of the HTML. Because remember, here we are actually starting this by saying inner HTML. So we're going to create a constant here, we're going to say document and we're going to say dot create element, which is how you create a new HTML element while you're in JavaScript. And that element is going to be a paragraph. And then take this paragraph and go into its inner HTML. And here, be sure to not write a quotation marks here like this or a double quotation. Here we want to add a backtick, which is different. And we want to add two backticks. And then let's make some space in here. 
And that is how we define uh, HTML code inside of uh, JavaScript. So now the JavaScript knows that this is HTML and not, let's say, variables, because now everything inside of here, you know, is HTML. It's, it's um, orange, as we can see. So it's important that it's backticks and not uh, uh, double, like, or double or single quotations. <clears throat> then inside of here, we are going to create a div. So like so, and a closing div tag as well, like so. And then inside of the div, it's going to have a class of equals to, and here we have double quotes. That class is going to be called to do container, container like so. We are basically making the and adding the the HTML, the structure of the HTML inside of our JavaScript, and we're going to do that for each to do we make. Inside of this div, we are going to have an input. And then an input doesn't have a closing tag. It is a so-called self-closing element. And here we're going to have a type. Set that equals to double brackets. And that's going to be a checkbox. It is also going to have a class equals to double quotation marks to do check box as well as an ID equals to input dash and here is also another interesting JavaScript uh, code we're gonna write we're gonna write dollar and then curly brackets and you see this becomes yellow and that's basically how inside of this HTML we kind of get to use JavaScript again. Now the file here recognizes that here we can put variables now again. Whilst here, if I were to try to reference, let's say the to-do, it would just be JavaScript, uh, sorry, HTML code, and it would just come out as to-do text. Whilst here, if I write to-do, I am actually referencing the variable to-do. And that's how we, Kind of mix HTML and JavaScript by using these backticks and also the dollar sign with um, curly brackets. So what are we giving it here? Well, we're giving it this index because every to do is going to have its own index and that is how we keep track of every one of them. And basically every to do is going to have its own ID called input zero, input one, input two, etc., etc. So here we're gonna say index. And then after that, we're gonna, let's just copy this dollar sign here. We're gonna say item, is it disabled? Basically meaning, does it have, if we inspect our application, we go to our to-dos, we see that our item disabled is false here. But when we say like this, item disabled, like so, we're asking, is this set to true? Whenever we're asking just like this, that means, is this true? If that is the case, then we want to give it the check attribute. If not, if not, we want to make it empty, which is basically giving in our HTML another attribute, which is either checked or nothing. So we are done with this part. Now we are going to create another paragraph here like so, and let's not forget our 
closing paragraph tag and inside of here let's see like so inside the first opening element we're going to give that an id which is going to be equals to to do dash and this index here also giving it a unique index this is to uh, both have a unique way to target an element but also to avoid some errors that we would get in the console and it's also going to have a class which is going to be equal to and here we're going to put the dollar sign again but we're going to change that to item dot disabled and we're going to ask the question again if it's disabled then this is what it's going to have disabled class and if it's not disabled then it's just going to have nothing which means no class so when something is disabled it's going to get a class a CSS class that we're in style, we actually have styled it. If we go up here and we see the disabled, let's see if we can find it. Here we go. We see that then it gets the disabled class and it gets a line through. And if it's not disabled, it just gets nothing. So no class is added. Or in other words, an empty class is added, which would make it a not a class. So it's normal if you're writing something wrong here when we're writing it like this, it's hard to pick up on any errors. Just to make sure that you are not stuck here, I have added this uh, finished code in the description below. So you can copy paste in this function if you run into any problems or something isn't working, or if you just wanna see the difference between our codes and reference the finished code. So you can find the link below uh, this video. So then, when we have added this paragraph, we also want to, inside here, we want to have an onClick. And that is going to be equals to, just make some space here, that onClick is going to be referencing the edit task. Because when we want to click the paragraph, we want to be able to edit the actual text there. And then, inside of there, we want to be calling some JavaScript again. We want to call the edit task on the index that we have clicked. We don't want to edit all the uh, text for all the to-dos. We just want to edit the task of the to-do we clicked. And then we are almost done here. We want to also add inside the actual paragraph, the item dot text like so and then we can kind of close this paragraph there and we close the div and then that should hopefully work uh, when writing that much code without testing it it's kind of inevitable that we have some bugs but I'm crossing my fingers then before we test we are also gonna target the paragraph we're gonna say query selector and then we're going to target the class to do check box like so. We're going to say dot add event listener. And we're going to say listen to change. That means if we edit the text when we've made it, then you're going to run an arrow function and inside of that arrow function we are going to toggle task and that is another function we haven't made yet and we're going to toggle not any task but the task that we have changed save that and also we are going to target our to-do list and we are actually going to add all the stuff 
that we just made like so and when I hit that save we see that we got the tasks that we have already been making in our project so it actually seems like we have correctly added our um, JavaScript and actually correctly made this code well semi correctly it might be something wrong here we see that we uh, have, don't have the um, correct uh, styling but that just might be a problem in the CSS let's leave that for the end for now we see that we are actually uh, adding and we are able to check our uh, code here so as we can see we have a little styling issue here let's reload the page let's I see here actually that we have forgotten well I'm blaming you I have forgotten to actually give this the display it should have so let's target the input here over input type checkbox uh, input type equals to and that's gonna be check box like so and then inside of here we're gonna have appearance none okay uh, we are on to the correct spot we're gonna have dot web kit appearance and that is also gonna be none we're gonna have dot mos appearance this is just making sure that the different browsers don't display it and then we're gonna have our cursor as we can see here as well it's not changing so we're gonna have cursor to pointer like so so now still not showing the check mark even though we might be actually checking it uh, the problem must be here somewhere uh, yes we have here an extra it's just one uh, colon here let's do that save that and that was not it but that was ah this is supposed to be checked and then it's supposed to say before like so now let's try there we go cool and then I also forgot to add some styling here just getting a bit late in the evening but uh, okay I just forgot a bit of styling here but we're gonna add it now no no harm uh, so here we are actually going to is there even a disabled one here okay I see what I did so let's copy the hashtag to do list P let's copy it down here and we're gonna change the second one instead of to do list P we're gonna say dot disabled and we're gonna keep the color as it is there that's correct but this one we are gonna uh, take away the color we're gonna say display flex looking better <laughs> And then we're gonna give it a gap of one rem and we are gonna give it a color of var dark like so and we are gonna align the items to the center and that's much better so as we can see also how cool is it it's taking shape uh, we can see that we are checking the tasks we are can uncheck them they are not being disabled which we're going to also fix it seems to be that can be a styling issue that can also be a javascript issue um, but we're going to fix that but as we can see how cool is it we can add a new task new task hit enter and then we see we get our new task you see that it's also refreshing our like all the check marks go away we're going to fix that 
but that is pretty pretty cool so we're getting close uh, to the finished result let's see because I see here that in our when we check our to do here let's say we check our first task here the text should be strike through as we can see here in our disabled here it should have a striked through text and the color should change to like a grayish color um, which makes me believe that we probably haven't added it correctly in our JavaScript. Ah, of course, we haven't, we're not actually uh, dealing with that logic in our display task. That is, of course, in another uh, function we're gonna create. Okay, so everything is good for now. Let's move on with our JavaScript. Let's create the function to actually toggle our tasks. So it's gonna be toggle task. And we're gonna say index, because you see here we are calling the toggle task when we are changing the actual uh, text here, when we are clicking the checkbox, which is this. So then, we want to take the to do with the index we click on. We want to go into that index. We want to go into like so. That's how we target it. And then we want to go into the disabled property that we have on every to do. And we want to say that it is not disabled. So we're just using the same code and saying not. And because it is by default false, it's going to be set to true. And then we also want to save to local storage so that it is saved to our storage, not just visually. And we want to display the tasks again with this new, uh, new visual appeal. So let's see, and we see that it works. So we're basically just switching between true and not true for the disabled feature, which means that the class that strikes this out is true and not true. Now it's getting a bit messy here. I want to enable this delete all button so we can clean this up a bit. Let's make the function function delete all tasks. And then I want to target the to-do. I want to say, instead of being what you are, I want to just put you as an empty array. And then I also want to save that to the local storage, like so. And I want to display the tax, tasks again with this new state. So let's try it. And it works. And then we can see in our inspect here, if we go into our application, we see that the to-do is now an empty array. We add a new task, it fills, we delete, it empties. Now, the only thing we're missing is if we add a new task here, new, and let's say I misspell it, tax. I would like to click this and now edit it. I can enable it and disable it, but I wanna edit this text and fix the typo here. So I'm gonna create a new function here over toggle task. I'm gonna say function edit task. And I'm gonna say index. Remember these are all the things we're, we're using those in the HTML here. Edit task we're using here. Toggle task we're using here. Okay. So edit task of the task we are currently on because we're targeting it with its position. We want to add a new constant here. We're going to say to do item. It is going to be equal to document dot get element by ID. And then important, use backticks here, not uh, quotes. 
we're gonna say to do dash and then we're gonna use the dollar sign and then the curly brackets index and then after that we're gonna create a constant egg existing text and we're gonna set that to to do index and text so what does this mean well we are saying that to do item we're just creating that is equal to the to do with the index that we are sending in so the to do item is the item that we click on basically and then the existing text is the text that is inside of the to do that we click on that is what we have defined here and then the new constant is the input that we are giving it so the actual new stuff that we are putting onto the text or the change of the text basically so the document we're going to create an element here create element we're going to say it's going to be an input because here there's no input here there's nothing happens but we want to when we click on this it's going to create a new box here for us to actually add or change this text in reality we're going to be adding new text so let's target this input element dot value and we're going to say that's going to be existing text so we're going to start by putting this empty input and putting it equals to the text that is already there so that it doesn't start from scratch and then we're going to say to do input we're going to say replace replace with the input element like so then we're going to basically be putting in whatever we input into this oh sorry it's going to be to do item here not to do input so then the to do item here the whole item is going to be replaced with what we are writing in or actually for now it's only what is already existing there then we're going to say input element dot focus which means that when we start writing automatically it's not going to be writing here it's going to be focusing on the input we clicked on so it's going to be being able to write there then let's get to the actual writing target the input element we're going to add an event listener we're going to say blur and blur means basically when the focus ends so blur is the end of focus so when we click this now this is focused and when we click out that's a blur so when a blur happens then the function that is going to be run is going to be const updated updated text is equal to input element dot value dot trim to remove the blank space which is a fancy way of saying uh, the updated text is the whatever we wrote inside of the new input here look at that then if updated text exists then we want to go into the to do into the index go into the text and we want to set that to the updated text like so and then we want to save that to the local storage like so and then we also want to 
display that in our actual list like so. So let's delete the task here. New tax. I wrote it wrong. I want to change it. Task. And I hit, or I just click out actually. We haven't added the functionality to hit enter, but you could if you want here. But we just click outside and we see that the task has been updated. And it should also be updated in our application. New task, let's change it again. Let's say three. And we see that it updates in the local storage as well. So with that, I think we have everything. We can add our task, we can hit enter or click. We can delete all, ah, we don't have our counter, of course, this is not working. So we forgot to put the counter function here, uh, which is not really that advanced. Let's go into our display tasks function here. And at the end here, no, it's here to do count. Why is it not? working to do count to do count let's see if we are getting any errors console script 51 that is indeed our to do count so something is not working to do count get to do count maybe we just misspelled it let's see Let's copy that here. To do count, we don't counter. Ah, we forgot to add an ID here. We forgot to just add it. So like so, always be checking your script here, your console. We see when I added that. It disappeared and let's add a new task and we see that our counter is working cool the way that it is working let's see here to do count text content basically let's let's basically actually let's inspect here let's go to the console Let's just copy to do count and write it in here. Hit enter. And then if I hover over, you see that it counts. It targets this. Now, let me target this whole thing. Put it in there. Hit enter. You see that that's the six. And then let me target this one. Put it in there. You see that the length of to do is six. So we're just putting it Let's see, also the to-do. So the to-do is the actual array. We see that the length of the array is six. One, two, three, four, five, six. It starts on zero because an array is a zero-based index. Um, that's just the thing you have to get used to, and it's very common in programming that things start from zero. So the first position of any array is usually zero. Um, but it is six uh, items inside of here. So the length is six, and that is basically how we're counting this. We're saying that the to-do count text content, which is the inside of the to-do content, we're just setting it equal to the length of the array always. So when we add things or remove things, like so, it's going to update this uh, um, number here as well. And with that, I think we can check, we can check off, we can edit, we can delete, add a new button, and it counts. With that, our task is done. I hope you really enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed coding it along with me. Um, as mentioned, if you want to reference the code, if you have any bugs, please check the description below uh, for the finished code. 
uh, you'll find a GitHub repo there where you can download the code. If you have any questions or something was unclear, please let me know in the comments. Uh, I'll be making more of these JavaScript based um, teachings and tutorials where we're going to be diving more in depth about learning JavaScript from scratch and also of course building full projects from them because I think by building that is when you really learn. Uh, so please let me know also what kind of project you would like to see next. And if you like this video, then I highly suggest watching this next video that is suggested for you here. Until next time, see ya.